Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Jeremy Brustel, and I am the uh, chief scientist at Risk Zero. Uh, and today, I'm going to be telling you guys all about uh, how you can use zero knowledge VMs to run arbitrary code, including Rust code, for example, inside a zero knowledge proof. Uh, so I'm just going to get started on that. Uh, so just you know, as a rough piece of background, for what are zero knowledge proofs? Well, they allow you to prove that a statement, like say for example, you know, this chess position has checkmate one move. Uh, you can prove that that's true to someone, and you can, which is called soundness, and you can also do so without revealing all of the information necessary to do that computation. So for example, you can say, well, I'm not gonna tell you what the move is that leads to checkmate, but there is one, uh, which is called, which is the zero knowledge property that zero knowledge proofs are named after. Um, and then finally, you can do that in a way which is, uh, doesn't require the person checking the proof to actually do all the computation. So the, the verifier can run much faster than the prover. Uh, this is called succinctness. Uh, and why is that relevant? Well, I mean, obviously the zero knowledge part is hugely important for uh, privacy. And because you can now trust some third party to correctly execute code, and you can check their work faster than they took them to do it, that turns out to have lots of important applications for scalability in terms of blockchains. Um, so I won't go into too much more detail on that, uh, but I think lots of people have seen sort of the emergence of zero knowledge proofs and how useful they are. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how you actually write a zero knowledge proof. How do you program them? So at the underlying mathematical level, there's this whole process by which you translate like a human understandable statement like this position has you know, checkmate in one move into a system of polynomial constraints over finite field elements, which you know, may not be the most programmer friendly way to represent things, right? So there's been work to try to make it easier on programmers. So the, the first option in terms of how you could actually, uh, you know, make a zero knowledge proof is to actually go and write the arithmetic circuits yourself. Uh, you know, this has an advantage of being the lowest level, giving you the most control, the best performance, but effectively you have to learn an entirely new syntax. It's also not really programming in the traditional sense. It's more like building a circuit, like uh, it's more like hardware design. Uh, there's no loops, you know, you, there, and you have to also understand all the details of the math. You need to know what a finite field is. You need to know what polynomial constraints are. Uh, this, for example, here is uh, some code that actually just t either switches the order of two values based on uh, whether another value is zero or one. And, you know, it's not super self-evident. Um, the other option is that you can make a high-level language that then compiles down to a circuit. This is what some people like Alio, for example, do. Uh, it's a lot easier. It's much more like normal programming. Um, but you still need to learn a new language. Uh, you still do need to understand the basics of some of the math under the hood. And it has very limited sort of control flow. Uh, you can't generally, for example, do a loop over, you know, some number of elements that where the number of elements isn't known when you build the circuit. Um, and you can see, for example, here's an example from the, the ALO examples of uh, a tic-tac-toe uh, prover, and you can see that all of the logic has been totally unrolled because of this sort of limitation with regard to loops. Um, so again, you know, useful, and for many cases, totally sufficient, uh, and it gives you a fair amount of control, but probably not the best option. So this idea has come up of the uh, zero knowledge virtual machines, which is, what if you wrote one circuit that actually acted like a little VM? And so now one person's in charge of making this complicated arithmetic circuit thing, but then everyone else can just use it. And you can run different programs on the same circuit by just taking your code, compiling it down into some representation that the circuit understands, and then having the circuit sort of execute your code, right? Uh, so this is this idea of a zero knowledge virtual machine. Um, and, oops, uh, hold on, is this the right? Yeah, so, so the question is, what if you, oh yeah, sorry, this is right. So, so once you have a ZKVM, uh, that gives you a bunch of advantages. So when you have a ZKVM, now you can actually run general purpose code. You can have control flow, you can have loops, you can have RAM, and you can treat it like writing normal code. 
Um, and one thing you can do is you can then make a custom zero-knowledge virtual machine with a custom language on it, which is what, say, uh, you know, StarkNet does with Cairo. And um, so it's a much better programming environment than something that has to compile to a circuit, but it still has issues because you still have to learn a new syntax and you still have to use, understand finite fields. And also, you know, you're limited to what, every time you make a new language, you start over in terms of ecosystem, in terms of libraries, in terms of, you know, support for um, existing stuff. So what if we instead made a zero-knowledge virtual machine that could run actual ordinary existing code that already exists. We don't make a new language. We want to build something that can run something you would already use. Okay, and actually that's exactly the idea behind uh, all of the sort of ZK EVMs that are out there right now. Uh, and so the theory behind this is, well, everyone writes in Solidity, so if we make a virtual machine that's zero knowledge virtual machine uh, that can run that Solidity code or that can run EVM opcodes, then suddenly you don't have to rewrite all these things. You can actually just make zero knowledge proofs of existing code. Um, and that's super cool. And there's a ton of really cool projects out there doing this. Um, I, I, I mean, there's more than would fit on my list here. And uh, so I'm, I won't, I'm not going <laughs> to, there's a lot of good work being done there. Um, so, you know, at risk zero, we wanted to actually say, well, what if you wanted to run non-EVM code, what if you wanted to just run some Rust code or some C++ or some Go or a really traditional language, um, which is great because all those languages have really huge ecosystems. And so that's our idea is to basically make a ZKVM that allows you to run code in a normal language that, you know, lots of programmers already use. In our case, we focused on Rust as our primary sort of most well-supported mechanism. And what's cool about here is that not only does this code look just like ordinary code, it, you can run any kind of thing you could do in Rust. There's no limitations in terms of, I mean, besides the fact that it runs slower because it's in a zero knowledge proof system. Um, and it also allows you to leverage all of the huge existing ecosystem that these languages have, right? So, for example, uh, if you want to prove this thing about chess positions I was talking about earlier, you don't have to rewrite the rules of chess in this, in a new language, you don't have to do any of that work because someone has already written a chess library that can, in fact, knows all the rules of chess that can process whether a move is, in fact, you know, a checkmate or not, whatever. So, so that allows you to really quickly develop new, uh, new code uh, in a zero knowledge proof, and you can still get all the zero knowledge properties, right? So, I think that sort of zkVMs in general are kind of where. Uh, you know, zero knowledge is moving. There are still use cases where it makes sense to go hand write a circuit, but I think for the vast majority of use cases, you're going to see these sort of ZK VMs and you know, including ZK EVMs um, as something that's moving forward. So just to go into a little bit of details of sort of what this looks like, um, and the workflow would be, you know, similar for an EVM. Uh, basically, you start off with Rust code. And in our case, you actually compile it down to a RISC-V executable. RISC-V is just a type of processor, like an Intel processor or um, you know, an ARM processor. Uh, we chose RISC-V as the thing to write our VM in, in part because the RISC-V processor is, uh, has a very small instruction set, so it le lends itself to a very fast and small VM, which is important because you know, we have to fit it inside of a zero-knowledge circuit. Um, so you basically compile the code down, you get an uh, image, and then you basically hand that binary effectively to the actual zero-knowledge virtual machine, uh, which then actually executes that program inside the VM. Um, and then what that does is that results in a zero-knowledge proof that you can then show someone, then allow them to verify that you correctly executed that code um, from that particular binary. Uh, so it allows you to basically prove arbitrary things to people in a very sort of uh, developer-friendly sort of manner, right? So uh, I think this is a super useful fundamental technology. Um, and, you know, we currently uh, have open sourced um, our entire prover, our verifier, the GPU acceleration for all of these things. So this is something that you can actually use right now um, to do this actual zero-knowledge proof process. Uh, so, but one question is, so that's great. It's really cool that you can make zero knowledge proofs, but how do you actually get these zero knowledge proofs on chain, right? 
Um, and I think that uh, if you look at sort of the use of zero knowledge proofs across the industry, there's lots of different ways that people have uh, done this. Um, and basically, we are uh, here uh, introducing, we just introducing this new technology, which is called Bonsai, which is basically uh, a way to help make it easier to interact with zero knowledge proofs across uh, multiple blockchains. Um, and so this is something that we, 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 we just announced. Um, so what exactly is Bonsai? It's basically a way to allow you to run arbitrary zero knowledge proofs and to get those proofs on chain and to make it easier to build on-chain apps that take advantage of the capacity for zero-knowledge proofs. Um, and so, to explain a little bit how that works, um, you know, if you, say, wanted to have an Ethereum, you know, uh, smart contract that wants to do offload some compute, let's say you're doing a, you know, something complicated like order matching, and you pay, cost a lot of gas to do all the order matching. So you'd like to move all the computational complexity off-chain to a zero-knowledge compute and then just verify that you did, in fact, do the proper order matching on-chain. So how would you do that? So the idea is, is that we, uh, for each chain we integrate with, we provide this on-chain proxy contract. You basically send to the proxy contract, this is the thing I would, this is the uh, program I would like you to execute. Please go execute this, prove it. And our, basically, we have a, we'll, we'll, we'll watch the chain. We'll see that this was done. We'll go to our, uh, the, the Bonsai Proving Network. There it will be proven inside of the Zero Knowledge Proof System. And then we basically roll up all of these proofs into a single uh, master proof, which we then post back onto chain and verify on chain. And so all that verification mechanism is done by all of our on-chain proxy contract. So at the end of the day, in terms of how you would actually use this in practice, you basically just ask the proxy contract to prove something, and then sometime later, the proxy contract says, oh, hey, I've proven it, and now you can basically move a huge amount of your you know, compute-heavy logic off-chain. And moreover, you can write logic that is a easier to represent in normal languages. So if you have something like you know, a game physics engine or something else that might be awkward to write in Solidity uh, or wants to use, make use of existing um, Rust or C++ code, for example, you can do that in a really useful way. So, and uh, what exactly, how does this all actually work? Um, so the idea is that when you make a proof, there's an initial proof request and that proof request goes to the uh, proving marketplace uh, where basically there are provers that run uh, and that produce the proofs. Now, the nice thing about zero-knowledge proofs is we don't have to trust the people who are making the zero-knowledge proofs because if they make a bad zero-knowledge proof, the verifier will fail to verify, which means that it's actually easy to make an open marketplace for people to do proofs. Um, and then that, that those proofs then also need to be uh, rolled up, uh, which is basically this mechanism using uh, recursion, which is a way in which you can use a zero-knowledge proof to run the verifier inside the prover so that you can prove that two proofs are correct in one proof. Uh, it's a very fun, uh, fun little trick. Uh, and this is also, and many other zero-knowledge proof systems are using the same mechanism for recursion. And then what we do is we then take that resulting root proof that we generate and we actually post it across any sort of chains that we integrate with. And of course, uh, Ethereum is, you know, sort of our, uh, you know, main initial target, but we're looking to support other chains as well. And so the idea would be that you'd be able to verify these proofs on multiple chains. Now, once, it's, once that proof has landed on the chain, then your, our, our, our app, our um, proxy contract can let you verify your specific proof that you care about is in this sort of rolled up proof by doing a Merkle inclusion proof on chain. Um, so if you want to check any of this stuff out, uh, we have the uh, sign up link for early access to uh, Bonsai, which will allow you to uh, get into our sort of uh, program for alpha users so that you can uh, start experimenting with Bonsai. Uh, the existing uh, zero knowledge VM itself uh, is actually already you know, ready to go. Uh, it is uh, open source and available at our GitHub, um, as well as uh, sort of the developer starter template for Bonsai, so you can kind of see what's going on with that. We also uh, have a 
uh, early access program for other for general uses if you want to do some kind of crazy thing with the ZKVM. Um, but uh, it looks like I'm actually running a couple minutes early, apparently. So uh, I would like to take some questions from the audience if anyone has any questions. Uh, could you just go over like the performance impacts of running these th this code inside of a VM? Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the question was, what sort of performance impacts are there in terms of running these sort of things inside of a, a zero knowledge VM? Um, so of course, zero knowledge proofs uh, do take a lot more computational work than just running something directly. Uh, currently, our ZKVM runs at about 50,000 instructions per second, uh, which means you can run, you know, reasonable and non-trivial things inside the ZKVM and prove them. Uh, additionally, we are adding support in the near future for a mechanism called continuations that allows us to parallelize the proving process across basically as many nodes as you want. And so we should be able to achieve uh, performance in terms of compute per second as, as large as you would like if you're willing to pay for it effectively. Um, uh, and also, we do, we do ex uh, are continually making improvements in sort of the base. Uh, oh, and by the way, when I say 50,000 cycles per second, I mean on my M1 MacBook. Uh, so uh, just to clarify what hardware that involves, uh, probably a lot faster on a fast GPU, but I don't actually have the latest numbers for that. Uh, and we're continuing to improve the performance on that, um, although I would, you know, it is expensive, effectively. Are there code size limitations? Uh, I can imagine if you can import all the libraries you want, that might be a problem. Uh, so the question was, are there code size limitations? And the answer is, uh, Currently, the ZKVM uh, has a maximum memory uh, size of 256 megabytes. Uh, so as long as the program you are compiling down and running fits within, uh, we typically reserve half of that for code and half of that for data. So you know, if you fit in 64 megs or 128 megs or such, you should be good, which all, many, many, many things do. Uh, we are working on a new version of the circuit which probably is a good couple months away where we'll actually go up to the full four gigabytes of addressable memory. Um, so I'm excited about that, but that'll be a bit. Yep. Are there plans to support other instruction sets like double LVM? Uh, so the question was, are we gonna support other instruction sets? Uh, so I think you mentioned LLVM, is that correct? Yeah, so LLVM actually already compiles down to RISC-V. So if you have something that can back end to LLVM, you are good to go. In, um, in fact, actually, I, I believe one of the projects we're going to start looking at at some point is actually there's a Solidity to LLVM uh, translation, so we might look into that as a way to run Solidity code in these things. Um, but uh, in general, there are, you know, we are looking at lots of other ways to transcode different kinds of use cases to this system, but yeah. Yeah, I've noticed that you guys are doing some like a benchmark testing. Could you give us some sense on that? Uh, yeah, so we have been participating in some benchmarks. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't actually have the URL to them, but I believe if you go on to the some of the things here, you'll be able to find them. Uh, the short version is I think we've compared very favorably. I think we come to other uh, sort of ZKVM proof systems. Um, we, the benchmarks include things like comparing how many SHA hashes you can do per unit time, um, some other general purpose computing use cases, um, things like that. Uh, but I think that the, we, we are very interested in being very transparent about all of the performance and we actually are very strongly um, encouraging other people in the ZK ecosystem to start to try to consolidate and uh, actually have more comparable benchmarks across more proof systems. Because we think, I mean, personally, if I didn't know a huge amount already about zero knowledge proof systems and I went out into the ecosystem to look around about which sort of, you know, prover to use and how to do things, I actually think it's quite confusing and hard to compare um, systems out there right now. So we really strongly believe that the industry needs to sort of be uh, more transparent and uniform in terms of how it reports benchmarks, so. I think I'm almost out of time, too, but, yeah. In your, in your 
Server network, are you also distributing verification? Are there verifiers that are separate from the party that's submitting the compute request? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So the yeah. Yeah. So the question was, uh, sort of, are the people in the network who do proving the same as the people who do verifying, and how do you uh, make sure that the verifiers are are not dishonest? And basically, the short version is that um, one of the wonderful things about zero knowledge proofs is that uh, you can verify an arbitrarily large amount of proofs with a single verification using recursion. And when we talk about when we post this to Ethereum, we actually run the verifier, uh, or, or will be running with uh, the sort of Bonsai release, uh, we run the verifier inside the Ethereum EVM. And so presuming you trust the you know, uh, Ethereum EVM, which if you don't, <laughs> we got bigger problems, the, uh, the, the short version is that you can trust that the verifier was honest. And as long as you know the verifier is honest, everything else follows from the mathematical properties of zero knowledge proofs. All right, well, I think I'm out of time. So thank you, everyone, uh, and have a great day.